Thank you very much, Professor Standing. Welcome, Jens Varoufakis. I assume he doesn't need any introductions, but if somebody does not know who Jens Varoufakis is, I can explain privately afterwards. <laughs> Am I required right now in your discussion, or rather later in the Q&A? So, Tiri Panda Sekhriya's almost. Okay. <laughs> I'll gladly stay here. Catch it. Jake, just give me a second to say a few words in Greek. Επειδή είναι πολύ δύσκολη η συζήτηση σε δύο γλώσσε, ακόμα και όταν υπάρχει μετάφραση, θα μου επιτρέψετε να του θέσω κάποια ερωτήματα στα αγγλικά. Υπάρχουν τα, μηχανα... τα μηχανηματάκια. Όποιο δεν τα έχει πάρει, έχουμε μετάφραση. Οκ, αυτό ήταν το πρώτο. Αυτό ήταν το πρώτο. Οκ. Δεν ξέρω ότι you were an honorary professor at the University of Sydney. So we have that in common as well. <laughs> It's very difficult to do anything other than. Just warm up the audience with a few questions. So I'll ask three or four questions. Uh, the reason why I said it's very difficult to do anything beyond that is because it's impossible to disagree. Um, we are, unfortunately, uh, boringly, uh, too, too much in sync with one another to have any meaningful disagreement. Apologies for that, if you were expecting a disagreement. Okay, so question number one. I'll ask three or four questions and then I will pass the button on immediately to the, the audience. Okay, first, let me preface the question. Guy talked about online labor. Before we came here, just before we came here, I went online and I checked two websites that are um, sweatshops, digital sweatshops. Guy knows them, maybe you haven't heard of them. One is called Mechanical Turk, and it's owned by Amazon. And the second one is called Pico Workers. What happens with these websites is anyone can, in the same way you start an account with Twitter or Facebook, you start an account, uh, you don't need any identification whatsoever. Okay? You state, you answer some questions about your skills, and immediately you start getting offers for jobs. When I say jobs, I mean tasks. Mm. So, you know, here are a thousand photographs. Can you tell us which ones are photographs of cats? Yeah. From that kind of very basic rubbish to very complicated coding jobs. You know, write an algorithm that does this. Mm. So that's sophisticated stuff. Okay? Yeah. And there, there is a competitive process. So you're there in, in the same way you receive a notification. A job task comes to you. If you click on it, immediately you get. If you don't click on it and somebody else clicks on it, you're out. Um, and each job has a different employer, a different wage, and you click on the one you want. So, what is the point of having checked it just before I came here? There were 25 million people that were logged in in real time, just before this meeting. Okay, so that you get an idea of what guy is talking about. And that brings me to the first question. Your three dimensions. One, relations of production. The second one, um, relation to the state. Actually, that was the third one. And the second one was relation to distribution. Okay. Should there not be a fourth one? relation to technology, because the algorithms are changing the nature of work, and not only the nature of work, but the nature of one's relationship with one's self. So when, for instance, somebody works on Pico workers or, or um, Mechanical Turk, they have fixed costs, they have to pay the rent, so they have, will have to keep taking the pings until they reach the level where they can pay today's rent. So that's, that is quite different to being a dock worker during the precarious times prior to trade unions, when you are lining up with other people at the docks. Or another example, as we speak, as we speak, there are 60,000 people in the general Shenzhen area of China who are making 
more than $50,000 a year playing American games, video games. Playing video games by Valve Corporation, by EVE Online. And because they're good at it, they get paid by the companies to play them so that other people can watch them and pay a fee to watch them. And the American company in Seattle takes. So these are all algorithmic relations of production which do not fit into what we lefties have traditionally referred to as relations of production. Will you add the fourth dimension? Is that your, how many questions? You That's said one. you had That's four one. questions. I was leading to that question. Uh, the rest was not questions. Okay. Uh, questions let, from the audience will be briefer, shorter. Yes, <laughs> let, 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 me, let me add to what Yanis has, has just said. It's actually called Amazon Mechanical Turk. Mm. And uh, it has 25 million around the world who are online. And what they're doing is competing with each other. But they don't know who are the others competing with them. They don't even know who the employer is. They don't, that's right. They don't know the employer. And what happens is you have intermediaries who are essentially labor brokers. Labor brokers who are taking 25 to 50% of every labor transaction done on Amazon Turk or the others. And this leads to a belief I have that we have to have digital levies that are on every transaction. That should be one of the simplest policies. But actually, I think I would prefer to keep the three dimensions because the technological issues can be inserted in the relations of production. They are a form of relations of production. It's part of what I call the heteromation in my, in my talk. The heteromation where we're being controlled by machines. We all should be paid by Jeff Bezos and these other people because we, every time we use our computers, we are contributing to their income. We all know that, right? We should be having a digital levy which should be very high and it should be part of this new income distribution. So for me, it's, it's part of the first dimension. And I think a target for politics should be on the labor brokers, the apps, the people who are controlling the apps. Because much of the Mechanical Turk and other online is actually controlled by intermediaries. And there's a huge scandal in that millions of people who are doing that labor never get paid. They can not be paid with impunity. They just say your work wasn't good enough. It was too late. And they don't get paid. And because of their weak bargaining position, they can't do anything about it. And that, that is part of the relations of production. So we can continue this discussion on that issue. I would prefer to just keep the three dimensions. Because for me, it's the third dimension of class where we should focus our political strategy. Not the first, but that's another issue. Well, following up from this, Levies, a bit like taxes, are fine for arresting externalities, that the damage to the environment and so on. But as, I will say the N word, as Marxists, speaking for myself, should we not have a serious discussion about ownership of the means of production? And given that the algo, the algorithm, is now the means of production. If you are on, you know, on Amazon Turk, it is the algorithm that is the means of production, the equivalent of the factory and the machinery. Hmm? What do we have to say about turning the algorithm into a commons? Let's not forget that the first internet was a commons. Hmm. The first internet was created by the state, by academic institutions, by individuals, privateers who were nevertheless offering their work for free to the commons of the internet. So every time you go into a website where it says HTTP, right? This HTTP is a language. Somebody wrote it and sold, and sold it for zero, gave it away. 
like the vaccine for polio. So SMTP, you may have seen SMTP where you send emails. This is another protocol language. It was written by we know whom, still alive, for free, and given to the Internet Commons. Since the whole process of, you know, you call it Retirean, retir capitalism, I call, call it techno-feudalism, um, is all about privatizing the commons with Web2 through big tech. Should we not be talking about um, public ownership of the algorithms? I would, I would be strongly in favor of, of that. And I would start with uh, uh, socializing uh, the algorithm used by BlackRock, which is the most important uh, algorithm in the world. And it, nobody understands it, not even Larry Fink, who owns it effectively. But here's an algorithm which controls probably 50% of the world's stocks right now. That it determines who, where investments go. And the algorithm, no, none of us can understand it. So I'm, I'm, all, in, I'm all in favor of a strategy of, uh, of revi reviving the digital commons, and I have argued that in, in the plunder of the commons, as you know. So, yeah, the more we can, the more we can get control of that, the better. Yeah. Two more questions, so start preparing your questions. <laughs> Me? Two more questions to warm you up a little bit more. Um, this year, well, the last 12 months or so, the happiest news we've had in this country and we haven't had that many happy news, was the success of uh, the workers uh, in eFood, which is the Greek Deliveroo, in organizing the precariously employed eFood workers into a magnificent strike, um, and actually winning some important rights. It was the first time, hopefully not the last, that one of these uh, algo-driven massive employers uh, conceded. And I believe we have in our midst one of the persons that uh, helped organize that strike. There he is. Now, before we give him... <laughs> before we give him the floor... Hmm? Okay. You're not getting any, a bite at the cherry, sorry. The, you, you join up the queue. Uh, <laughs> be, before, be, before we give him the floor, I would like you to say something to him from your perspective. What can your book offer him? I think the first thing I could offer is something very simple. Very simple. We need to reconceptualize what we mean by work. It is a disgrace that in the 21st century we still have politicians and economists ignoring the work that occupies more people's time than any other. And that's care work done by women. It's a sexist perspective. And for people who are doing the sort of labor that you are representing. As I said in my talk, they have to do a hell of a lot of work that nobody recognizes. Work that if we understood how much is being done, we would have policy to say, how do we limit that? How do we restrict that? How do we deal with that? I've got a, a term that I use, I was going to mention it, but I ran out of time. Repetitive application syndrome. I don't know how you would translate that. But if you're in the precariat, you're constantly having to apply, 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 get turned down, fill in forms, apply, do more tests, go online. Algorithms take up your time. If we had a reconceptualization in the state of statistics on work, then we would identify more of the things that we could do, a politics of time. Now, that may sound very boring, but unless we have a better picture 
of how people use their time. We won't have a correct set of policies. But of course we need stronger unions, stronger organizations, stronger regulations, stronger dealings with the algorithms and the labor brokers and the app people. Of course we need that as well. Θα του θέσω άλλη μια ερώτηση, just one more question. Στο μεταξύ, όποιοι από εσά έχετε έρθει τώρα τελευταία και δεν το ξέρετε, υπάρχουν μηχανηματάκια για μετάφραση. One last question. Over the last few days, we spent some time together in Aegina and we were chatting. And Guy criticized one of Mera 25 policies. And I think he may have a point. <laughs> But then again, I'm not sure. So I want to bring it out and to in include the rest of you in the debate. The policy concerned our proposal for a, a carbon tax. And let me remind you, those of you who don't know, and you have no reason to know what the Mera 25 policy on this is, uh, we have the policy of having a quite high carbon tax which is paid in proportion to the um, greenhouse effects that are being emitted hmm, into the atmosphere by everyone. But this is a neutral tax in the sense that all the money goes into a kitty, into a kubara, as we say in Greek, um, and then it is redistributed to the less well-off. So you overcompensate poorer people for the tax that they pay to put diesel in their car. So in the end, they are better off so they can afford greener technologies. That is the policy of Mera 25. His criticism was, and correct me if I'm wrong, guy, that there is an element of means testing here, that the state will have to say, okay, you deserve to take this, you don't deserve to take this, you're better off than this person, and so on. And this is a coercive mechanism. So his counter proposal was more along the lines of basic income. Take the sum and distribute it. You divide it by n, where n is the number of people in the country. Right? Correct? Is that what you're saying? And that when you finished, I'll say what I said. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and that, because that way, you don't give the state the exorbitant power to decide who takes it and who doesn't take it. Uh, I understand that, and that's why that, that's the strength of basic income. But it's politically, and I want to share this concern, this anxiety with you. It is difficult to say to poor people that you're going to be taxed when you put diesel in your car or whenever you consume a product that whose manufacture led to, 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 main, to high emissions. You will be taxed, and some of that money is going to go to rich people as well. Guy. Okay, um, slight misrepresentation, but <laughs> fair game. What, what I'm arguing in my books is that we should Forget build... Forget your book. Tell me what you were arguing with me in Aina. What I argue in the books is <laughs> we should start by calling all taxes that are on ecological issues levies rather than taxes. The reason to call them levies is that they become the mechanism for building up a common fund from which basic income is paid out. I believe in a high carbon tax or levy, a progressive one. But you will not get political support for a carbon levy unless you promise to recycle all the revenue you raise from the green carbon levy to the populace, to the population. And you have to get the support, not just of the bottom third, but the two thirds above them. The, both the moral support and the political support. And where people have said, you have a carbon greenhouse gas emissions levy, recycle all the revenue to equal payments for everybody, Automatically, that is progressive because it represents a higher amount proportionately for a low income person than for a rich person. But better still, 
The rich person is consuming more fossil fuels and other forms of creation of greenhouse gas emissions and therefore is going to be paying more anyhow. And that creates the basis of a redistribution. Ironically, there is research to show that universal transfers, universal ca cash transfers, do more to reduce inequality than means-tested, targeted transfers. That's one of the paradoxes of distribution. And there's a lot of research that we can share on that. But I think the political point is what I would make to you, Yanis, and, and the party, which is that we will buy more support, we will get more support, if we say that everybody's going to benefit from this. And the people who are doing most of the pollution will be paying more. And that's what we want. Whereas the people who are the poor, who hardly cause any pollution, will be gaining from that process. So for me, that is something that should unite us as progressives, because we're universalists. I hate targeting. I hate means testing. Easy. And I know Yanis does too. But this is a difficult one for him. It's a question of tactics for me. Exactly. It's not a question of substance. I'm, With, I'm on on the substance, I agree with you. Yeah, but I'm but I can see the advertisements coming from the right, even from Syriza and from others, who say, Mera is proposing to give money to the rich. No, you can raise the marginal tax rate. You yeah. can do that. Okay, but you know, people don't know what marginal tax rate is. So anyway, it's, it's an interesting question. We promise to take it under an advisement, as they say. Good, good. Okay, so I've talked enough. And so Terry wants to ask a couple of questions, but he'll have to wait. Uh, we are going to open it uh, first to a woman. Sorry, okay. I'm the moderator. He's chair. He's chair. Okay. Now it's my time to sh shine. <laughs> we start with a woman, please. <laughs> I show. One of those, those hello. doesn't work. Ah, hello, no. oh. hello. Tell Hi, me. my name is Patti. Thank you for your talk and your presentation. And precisely because there are three men on the podium, I'll take a little bit of time. Good. Um, yeah, uh, taking advantage of my gender. So I have two questions. One is to Yanis, and the other one will go to Guy. Yanis, I'll take the opportunity of being here and talking about technology to ask you about uh, how you think about technology nowadays. I can remember a few years ago, because you are a sci-fi fan, saying about um, uh, your, the future that technology will be... Uh, There's something amiss with the microphone. Hello? Yeah. 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 That technology might be the environment or the tool or the path the, w uh, the, um, uh, so, yeah, the question was about technology. Maybe I remember wrong, but I remember that you had a thesis of that technology might be the tool and the path that will lead us to um, a um, society of equality. And nowadays, you're talking about uh, tech feudalism, which I, I find is a, a valid argument. Between those two theses, <laughs> and how can we eventually go to technology being provided by a society of uh, shared wealth? And the other question to so, by definition, our work uh, falls into precariety. Uh, organized society hasn't decide, decided. Um, if art is education, if it's a commodity, they don't know how it is produced or how it is consumed. And uh, it doesn't really fall into uh, capitalism um, explanations of uh, means of production. So uh, uh, with, the, with the result, people who work in the arts are always um, precarious, pre um, um, precarious in a space, yeah, precarious. Um, I am also happen to be a migrant in Greece. I migrated with my parents from Albania here in the early 90s. And I am also happen to have been one of those people who the parents helped to study. I went to uh, So 
what you described really um, touched me personally. Um, you started your talk uh, explaining the economy, which I find it's true about high, high finance, which is the main um, activity of economy nowadays, and we end it with technology, which also I find it's true. So now, um, thinking about um, the economy being so immaterial today, which is high finance and technology, most of the people do not have either understanding about high finance or um, not real connection with te how technology works, how internet works. You ended your talk um, by um, urging us, encouraging us to go to the commons. Say we go to the commons, what do we do at the commons to um, address high finance and technology powers? Or is, is our, our, our only tool, our uh, wage negotiation with the labor givers? And thank you for your time. You start. You start. You start. You start. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing happened in between. I used to believe that technology has the capacity to liberate us and the capacity to enslave us, all at once. So I never went from one to another. This is a dialectical contradiction um, regarding technology, and it's not new. If you go back to the time of, uh, of Hesiod, Hesiodos, you'll see the lamentation about the Iron Age, uh, where he says that um, uh, I pity the children of iron who would never be able to sleep at night or toil by day in freedom because they will be, what he meant was enslaved by the technology of iron, uh, while at the same time celebrating the civilization that came out of iron. So technology is an enslaver and a potential liberator at one and the same time. The question is not the technology, is who owns it and how it is being utilized and who tastes the fruits of the mechanical slaves. Yep. Well, well, first of all, thank you for, for the questions and comments. Uh, it reminded me as I was listening to you that I was invited to Silicon Valley and to Google, <laughs> the headquarters of Google, and speaking to all the, the plutocrats and uh, the elite. Uh, and they took me to a laboratory afterwards. And there was a robot in the laboratory. A robot who looked like m the Michelin man, you know, the, the, the tires, that sort of robot. And the robot turned to me, they'd obviously programmed it, turned to me like this, put its arm out and said, I'm going to take jobs from the precariat. <laughs> and I turned around to the robot and I said, we'll see about that, but I hope you're right. <laughs> right? Because I believe that we, we should not have a fetish about jobs. William the, Morris. I was about to say, my hero intellectually is William Morris <laughs> from the 19th century. But essentially, William Morris was about commoning. Commoning shared activities. He believed in a sort of form of guild socialism associated with GDH Cole later, but a sort of sense of being able to do the work of caring for other people, caring for the community, caring for and our art. society. Art. And he won't let me answer my own question. <laughs> and most importantly, artists understand that. I must have been invited to speak at 20 arts festivals in the last few years. And artists are in the precariat. They understand the precariat. But they also are not afraid of wanting to be part of the precariat because they live with projects. They live with commoning. But what they need is security. It's one of the reasons why I support a basic income. Because when we've done pilots, experiments with basic incomes, 
The first thing you see people doing is using part of their time to do these forms of work. More spending of time on art, more spending of time on gardening, on doing allotments, on creative activity and sharing, taking risks. Every single pilot in with which I've been involved, and I have been involved in quite a few, have shown this. And this sense of liberating time is precisely what we on the left should be, a, be all about. I don't want everybody to be in full-time jobs, jobs, jobs. The idea of liberation should be freedom from jobs. Yes, if I want to do jobs, fine, more or less. But really we want people to be able to do work that they wish to develop themselves, to develop their art, their creativity. That's what we want. And that's what every pilot I've seen, and I get emotional by seeing that outcome. But that's art. And that's why artists understand the precariat. And so all power to you. Now the microphone malfunctions so tell us many things about technology in this discussion. <laughs> now, we'll gather three questions. There are two microphones gracefully floating in the room. Οι ερωτήσεις μπορούν να είναι στα ελληνικά, αλλά πρέπει να είναι σύντομες για να τις μεταφράσω. One line, one sentence questions may be translated into English for Guy. Uh, many sentence questions will not be posed. I shall be bellicose and truculent. In... Uh, Guy, do you have the translation thing? Oh, yeah, yeah. oh okay. Then I will not be translated. The whole point is, we have so, the translation. Thank you to the translators. Professor Dikharakis, I will gather three questions for starters and then have another round as well. Okay, I'll ask just one question. Um, what do you think about using the slogan of dignity as part of our political agenda? I'm saying this because low income, loss of control of your time and supplicant status is something that undermines the role of uh, a person's dignity. So if we could incorporate in our political uh, speech or narrative, the issue of dignity, don't you think that this would be a, a great uh, uh, thing to, uh, and it's something that it is across class and political platforms, so I think this would be something uh, useful to do. Let us gather two more. Uh, the gilet jaune person, the yellow vest. <laughs> If available. Okay. Όχι. Okay. Με συγχωρείτε που θα θέσω την πρώτη ερώτηση στα ελληνικά. Γιώργος Αντωνιάδης ονομάζομαι. Ε, από μια πιο συντηρητική σκοπιά, το μέσο των αλλαγών που θα προτείνατε πάνω σε αυτές τις τρεις ε, προοπτικές ε, αλλαγής μετασχηματισμού ενός μετακαπιταλιστικού κόσμου, είναι κάποιο εργαλείο όπως οι κοινοβουλευτικέ. Ε, αλλαγές, όλη αυτή η διαδικασία που επιτρέπει ο κοινοβουλευτισμό μέσω της διαβούλευσης της συμμετοχικής δημοκρατίας ή χωράει στην ιδεολογική σασκευή και απευθύνομαι και στον κύριο Βαρουφάκη πιο επαναστατικού τύπου διαδικασίας ακόμη ακόμη και αν δεν είναι ελληνιστικής βίας να εμπεριέχει αντιλήψεις και εφαρμογές μια μορφή Βάλτερ Μπέργιαμιν θεϊκής βίας του προλεταριάτου. Το προλεταριάτου είχε μια δικτατορία, το προλεταριάτου που θα εφαρμόζει όλα αυτά. Το προλεταριάτου, ποιος θα τα εφαρμόσει όλα αυτά τα ωραία που λέτε. And the third question from a woman. Α, ah, please. Our vice chair, she's going to tell you. The microphone is approaching. Ωραία. Uh, Ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ για την εξαιρετική ομιλία σας ε, που μας έδωσε και γνώση και χαρά. Ε, ποιες είναι οι δυνατότητες αντίστασης σε αυτό το δυστοπικό ε, ε, τοπίο που μας περιγράφετε. Ε, ένα τοπίο απίστευτης εξατομίκευσης και ε, μετατροπής των ανθρώπων ε, σε μονάδες ξεκομμένος από την έννοια του κοινού και της κοινότητας. Ε, βιάζομαι να σας πω ότι δεν θεωρώ ότι οι ηλεκτρονικές μορφές 
οργάνωσης του πρικαριάτου ή του εναπομείνοντος προλεταριάτου είναι επαρκής γιατί βλέπουμε τη θρασνατοποίηση ε, και την μη συνέχιση των όποιων δυνάτων αντίστασης και επιτυχίας. Ευχαριστώ πολύ. Θα έχουμε και άλλο γύρο. There will be another round. Please, guys. Uh, let me begin with dignity. I think I entirely agree with you. Not because you're my publisher, but because I agree with you. Nick, he's not your publisher. I, I, he's no, no, he's, not my he's publisher. our comrade and colleague. Oh, he's a comrade. Sorry, I beg your pardon. I beg your pardon. He is the but publisher. I agree with you. But they look similar. They, no, they don't. But no, they don't. Dignity, <laughs> dignity is part of being in the precarious. The sense of indignity, the opposite, is what the precariat has to experience every day. Every day. Later this week, when I go back to Switzerland, I'm having a debate with some British MPs on Zoom about the policy in Britain called universal credit. Some of you may have heard of it. Which is a means-tested, behavior-tested form of of benefit with punitive intentions of denying people their benefits and punishing them. The worst feature of that policy is it removes any sense of dignity. And that is why they should be ashamed of themselves, the government, for implementing that sort of policy. You don't give a person dignity. Fuck off. That's how we feel. So that, that, for me, is a, a very important point. If I understand the second question, I hope I have understood it. I think we, we have to have an appropriate language today, so we cannot use terms like revolutionary, even if we want to be revolutionary in a, in a profound sense. I believe that we have to strengthen deliberative democracy and move away from this pseudo-democracy that we have today. We have to strengthen deliberative democracy. And that means at every level, not just in political discourse, but right the way through the commons, all the way down to your art guilds, to your care communities. We have to have governance structures which are mutualized and give deliberative democracy a strength. That, I think, is fundamental to a progressive politics. The last point, I think, it was touching on something, if I understood it correctly, about agency. How does the precariat get agency? How does the precariat become a class for itself? that in the Marxian terminology. I genuinely believe that is happening. We must remember that the proletariat took over 50 years before it became a class for itself with sufficient political power, and another 50 years before it reached power in the state. Okay? I think what is happening with the precariat is much, much quicker. We are getting a sense of agency. We're getting organization. Art is a classic case. Huge number of people are joining associations that are relating to their own interests with ecological basis, with care, with, with all the commoning in it. And I think that that is happening pretty quickly. So I'm quietly confident. But politically, movements like yours must encourage that. Encourage the agency. Encourage the deliberative democracy. Even if it means surrendering political power from the center, at least build up the governance of the commons. And that, I think, is an agenda that's exciting. It's really exciting. I will answer in Greek to yes, those three sorry. questions briefly. Um, Two words were born in 2015. Elpida, Axiopreppi. Ήταν οι λέξει με τι οποίε κερδίσαμε τι εκλογέ το Γενάρη του 2015. Ήταν οι λέξει οι οποίε μα πήγαν από το 36% στο 62% τον επόμενο Ιούλιο. Δυστυχώ, εξευτελίστηκαν. Εάν τώρα 
κάνουμε εμείς εδώ στην Ελλάδα την αξιοπρέπεια σημαία, απλά θα προκαλέσουμε την οργή των δικών μας ανθρώπων και τη χλέβη των αντιπάλων. Πρέπει να την ξανα ενεργοποιήσουμε τη λέξη. Δεν είναι η στιγμή, νομίζω. Έχει... Είναι απολύτως σωστό. Αυτό είναι το ζητούμενο. Το ζητούμενο είναι η αξιοπρέπεια. Αλλά όταν η λέξη έχει, κα... έχει καταργηθεί, όπως οι λέξεις ριζοσπαστική αριστερά, και αυτό τελείωσε το 2015, όταν στο όνομά της λες ναι σε όλα στην Τρόικα, το ένα. Το δεύτερο, όσο αφορά τη βία και τη δικτατορία. Καταρχά, άλλο να μιλάς στο 2015 για τη δικτατορία του, όταν η τότε ο Μάρξ αναφερόταν σε κοινωνίες όπου ήταν εξορισμού δικτατορίες. Εξορισμού δικτατορίες. Ακόμα και η φιλελεύθερη Αγγλία, έτσι, τι ποσοστό είχαν την ψήφο. Άρα ήταν μια δικτατορία. Το να χρησιμοποιήσει τον όρο τότε δικτατορία του προελευθερία, ουσιαστικά να μιλάς για δημοκρατία. Η δικτατορία των πολλών είναι η δημοκρατία. Υπήρχε ηρωνία. Σήμερα αυτή είναι μια λέξη α, που απλά είναι τοξική. Και σε καμία περίπτωση δεν πρόκειται να, να βοηθήσει ένα, ένα προοδευτικό κίνημα. Εδώ θα συμφωνήσω απόλυτα με τον Γκάι σε αυτό που είπε για deliberative democracy. Ο κοινοβουλευτισμό έχει τελειώσει. Σα το λέω σαν κάποιο που υποφέρει στο κοινοβούλιο, γιατί αυτό το πράγμα που ζούμε με τη Μαρία, με τον Γιώργο εκεί μέσα, δεν μπορεί να το πει δημοκρατία. Είναι μια παροδία, είναι μια ολιγαρχία με περιοδικέ εκλογέ που επανανομιμοποιούν την ολιγαρχία, την έλλειψη δημοκρατία. Η λύση βέβαια δεν είναι να πει ότι κρατάω το κοινοβούλιο. Η λύση είναι να πα ταυτόχρονα στο δρόμο των συνελεύσεων, αυτό που εμείς ονομάζουμε διαβουλευτικά συμβούλια κληρωτών πολιτών και κάποιους σε μη ψηφία εκλεγμένους, γιατί η κληρωτήδα είναι βαθιά δημοκρατική, που θα διαμορφώνουν τη συζήτηση, θα διαμορφώνουν τα δημοψηφικά ερωτήματα, όχι ένα ψυχρό δημοψήφισμα, ποιος θα γράψει το ερώτημα, και ταυτόχρονα θα έχεις την κοινοβουλευτική διαδικασία να πηγαίνουν χέρι-χέρι. Όσο αφορά για τη βία. Όποιο επικαλείται τη βία, τελικά την εισπράττει. Εμείς δεν θα επικαλεστούμε ποτέ τη βία. Αλλά ταυτόχρονα δεν θα είμαστε και αφελείς. Θα ξέρουμε ότι όταν θα αρχίσουμε να πλησιάζουμε προς την επίτευξη των στόχων, η βία θα μας έρθει. Το σύστημα είναι βίαιο. Και εμείς θα αμυνθούμε. Ένα round. Ξεκινούμε με την κυρία Κορνέ. Ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ για όλη αυτή την πολύ ενδιαφέρουσα συζήτηση και παρουσίαση. Θα κάνω μια ερώτηση από την πλευρά που αφορά την κυρίως την νεολαία. Ε, έχουμε έρευνες στην Ελλάδα σε σχέση με, με την νεολαία και με τις συνθήκες εργασίας και είναι πάνω κάτω αυτές που περιγράφεται πολύ άγριες, πολύ σκληρές. Ε, είναι το Πρεκαριάτο και έχει και ένα πολύ μεγάλο θυμό, όπως είπατε, και πολύ μεγάλη απογοήτευση, γιατί έχει ζήσει και πάρα πολλά χρόνια λιτότητας πολύ σκληρά στην Ελλάδα. Αυτή η νεολαία, κατά ένα περίεργο τρόπο, μιλάει επίσης πάρα πολύ συχνά για κάτι που εσείς το είπατε με άλλα λόγια, ελευθερία από την εργασία, μιλάει για τον ελεύθερο χρόνο. Γιατί και ο ελεύθερο χρόνο φαίνεται να έχει χαθεί μέσα σε αυτέ τι συνθήκε και να μην μιλάει πια κανεί για αυτή τη μεγάλη ουτοπία, α το πούμε έτσι. Μιλάνε λοιπόν για τον ελεύθερο χρόνο του, αλλά υπάρχει και ένα κομμάτι τη νεολαία που με εντυπωσιάζει και με προβληματίζει, που βλέπει την ελευθερία σε αυτήν την πρόσκαιρη εργασία, σε αυτή την νομαδική σχεδόν εργασία, λέγοντα δεν πειράζει, να το πω έτσι απλά, τώρα είμαστε νέοι. Α αποκτήσουμε χρήματα τώρα, ε, και αυτή είναι μια αναπαράσταση, ίσω μια κοινωνική αναπαράσταση, γιατί είμαι κοινωνιολόγο και με ενδιαφέρουν οι κοινωνικέ αναπαραστάσει. Και ε, τον ελεύθερο χρόνο θα τον βρούμε αργότερα. Και αυτό είναι κάτι που μου κάνει πάρα πολύ μεγάλη εντύπωση, γιατί υπάρχουν δύο αντικρουόμενε αντιλήψει. Οι νέοι που μιλάνε για τον ελεύθερο χρόνο που του λείπει, και οι νέοι που λένε Μα η εργασία είναι ελευθερία. Και αυτό είναι η πρώτη φορά που το ακούω, πρέπει να πω από τον καιρό που το είχα ξεχάσει όταν ήμουν φοιτήτρια και εμείς διεκδικούσαμε ελεύθερο χρόνο, όχι την ελευθερία, ως ελευθερία. Ευχαριστώ πολύ.
Παρακαλώ. Κώστα. Τώρα... Α, ωραία. Λοιπόν, ε, όταν σας άκουσα, εξεπλάγει πάρα πολύ θετικά, γιατί νόμιζα ότι άκουγα στην αρχή μια μαοϊκή ανάλυση. Δηλαδή, όλες αυτές, το μικρό, της μικρο, μικρή μικροαστική τάξη, τη μεγαλύτερη, όλους όσους θα συμμαχίσουν στην μεγαλύτερη τάξη, είναι και πάρα πολύ ωραίο αυτό, μόνο που δεν καταλαβαίνω πού το πάμε. Τι θέλω να πω. Η ταξική ανάλυση πρέπει να έχει και έναν άξονα ανατροπής. Διαφορετικά, απλά εξηγούμε τον κόσμο χωρίς να προσπαθούμε να τον αλλάξουμε. Έτσι. Το παράδειγμα το οποίο δόθηκε προηγουμένως για τον σύντροφό μας, τον συνδικαλιστή, δεν θα πρέπει να ξεχνάμε ότι ο συγκεκριμένος είναι προελετάριος. Δουλεύει μεν σε μία πλατφόρμα, αλλά δουλεύει χειρονακτικά. Έχει εξειδικευμένη εργασία χειριζόμενος μηχάνημα μεταφορικό και για να, το... για να μιλήσουμε ανάρχο συνδικαλιστικά έχει σχέσει συγγένειας με το συνδικάτο του και έχει σχέσεις συνάφειας με το εργατικό κίνημα στην Ελλάδα. Άρα αυτός κινείται προς την ανατροπή. Έτσι, κινείται επαναστατικά. Και δεύτερο πράγμα να πούμε και κάτι άλλο. Ή θα κινηθούμε επαναστατικά ή δεν μπορούμε να κάνουμε τίποτα, διότι στο τέλος ο κόσμος έχει γνωρίσει δύο δημοκρατίες. Η μία ήταν η δικτατορία του προλεταριάτου, που καθετοποιούσε την κοινωνία με τα προβλήματα που είχε, και η δεύτερη είναι αυτό που ζούμε, δηλαδή η δυτική αστική κοινοβουλευτική δημοκρατία, που είναι η δικτατορία του κεφαλαίου, άρα και της ολιγαρχίας και Πηγαίνουμε, Πάμε να αλλάξουμε τον κόσμο ή απλά να τον εξηγούμε. Βασίλη, νομίζω ότι θα φτερνίζεσαι με τόσες αναφορές σε εσένα, οπότε μήπως θα ήθελες να μας πεις δύο κουβέντες. Ο έτερος Κώστας, αν μπορεί, να μεταφέρει το μικρόφωνο. Ευχαριστώ. Ακούγομαι. Ναι. Ωραία. Ο αγώνας... Ωραία. Ο αγώνας που δώσαμε εμείς ήταν να προσπαθήσουμε να μην μπούμε στο πρεκαριάτο. Εμείς στην Ιφούντ e αρχικά εργαζόμασταν ως μισθωτή. Ε... Παρ' όλα αυτά, η εταιρεία προσπάθησε να μα κάνει όλου freelancers, δηλαδή να πληρωνόμαστε με το κομμάτι. Αυτό ήταν λοιπόν ο πρώτο αγώνα που κάναμε. Ωστόσο, στην πορεία του χρόνου βλέπουμε πόσο πολύ σημαντική είναι η αλγοριθμική διαχείριση, η οποία πραγματικά δουλεύει ω κάτι κρυφό. Ε, είναι η παραμετροποίηση που κάνει ο εργοδότη, δεν δίνει λογαριασμό σε κανέναν και πραγματικά σου κάνει τη ζωή ποδήλατο. Αυτή είναι μια ελληνική έκφραση. Ωραία. Σε ό,τι είπε, να τοποθετηθώ επίση αυτό που είπε ο Σαράντο πριν, ότι όντω το να κινείται κανεί συνδικαλιστικά το σωματείο του, σαφώς είναι προς την σωστή κατεύθυνση. Απλά ήθελα να πω το εξής, κι αν δεν μπορούμε να αλλάξουμε τον κόσμο, ας κουπίσουμε το δρόμο μπροστά από το σπίτι μας. Εμείς εδώ, το διπλανό, το διπλανό και ποτέ δεν ξέρεις. Αυτά, ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ. Of the precariat, I have called it the new dangerous class. And in the 19th century, the term dangerous class was used to describe people who were revolutionary in the sense that they didn't identify either with the bourgeoisie or with the proletariat. They were the craftsmen, they were the artists, they were the street traders, the people who didn't suffer from having a proletarian consciousness, thinking that being in wage labor is the objective. They were actually objecting and they were revolutionary in a different sense. For me, today, the precariat is the revolutionary class. And why it's the revolutionary class It is because, and I hope this can be understood, it's the only class that wants to abolish the conditions that define it and thereby abolish itself. 
Now that makes them dangerous and revolutionary conceptually and politically. Okay? When we use language in public discourse, we may not want to use that particular word. Okay? Because we want to win the argument against those who are not us. Fair enough. But we must understand that it is a revolutionary class. Because we are looking at a new future. We don't want laborism. We don't want to define our future as all being in jobs all the time. Why do we want to do that? Being in positions of subordination to capital or the state? Is that what we want? I don't think so, okay? For me, it's a matter of forging a better vocabulary, a better narrative, a better set of images. Otherwise, we will stay winning only 10% when we should be getting 30-40%. Whereas the scoundrels like Tsipras and like Boris Johnson and these characters will keep on winning with their lousy rhetoric. It's difficult for us, but we must look forward and be forging an identity. Who was, you were the one who were mentioning youth. Okay? We must understand that youth must identify with the language we use, with the terminology, with the concepts, with the dreams. And if they don't, we won't win. But I do think we will win. That's so that's cool the point. That you think that. But don't be patronizing. <laughs> I think that too, but I would add the word potentially a revolutionary class, right? It's yeah, not a revolutionary class. Objectively, of it itself. Should be. Yeah. Uh, the, a small segment of it is. I meet a lot of young people who are not striving to abolish themselves as a class, but they are trying, not through trade unionism, to escape the precariat, but through individual action. They are the ones who work 70 hours a week trying to create a startup in Silicon Valley. They borrow money, they work until they are 40, and they drive themselves into the ground and they burn out and nothing happens of it. They are the youngsters who approach me here in Greece, outside universities and schools, and they want hints and um, you know, advice on which cryptocurrency to, to buy in order to, to get rich quick. The, the algorithmic relations of production, together with the increasing devastation and you know, flex security or flexibility of, of, of the labor market, is creating these two antithetical antagonistic forces within the precariat. There are people like Vasily and Costa who try to abolish the class through collective action, and that's why they're here today. And there are the others who try to leave it behind the same way that, you know, in Manchester or in Birmingham in the 1930s, some enterprising proletariats tried to escape the proletariat but had no interest in abolishing the division between the capitalist class and the proletariat. And that's where, I mean, we, we don't disagree, I know that, but this is where political parties are assembled, and political movements. I didn't know whether you had concluded. We wish you wouldn't. <laughs> I, I, I would like to conclude by following from what Yanis has said and what you have said, that it always takes a vanguard, a minority, of a class to articulate and forge the imagination which will lead to more people realizing what it's all about. Of course it's a potential, of course, but it's a potential that we have to understand in order to articulate in the correct way. We don't want to be giving images of returning backwards. I quote in the book a lovely piece of graffiti on, the wall, on a wall in Madrid. And the graffiti says, 
the worst thing would be go to go back to the old normal. And that, I think, is a sense of being in the precariat. And it's important for people who are organizing, as well as people who are writing and speaking, to be trying to listen and articulate at the same time this new vision. Because unless we offer a future that's exciting, most youth will continue in the way you describe. But they don't want to be in full-time boring jobs for 30, 40 years. That's not what they want. And nor should they. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for coming here.